Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, a podcast that looks at the inspiration, intention, and actionable steps to help you jumpstart joy in the world, in your life, and in other people's lives. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 179. On this week's show, I'm doing a solo cast on how to set boundaries or definitions around the work that you do or the niche that you're in and around your time as an entrepreneur. I know that these are a couple of topics that we often struggle with when we have our own business, and I thought it would be really exciting and interesting to share how I approach both our niche and our time when we have our own business. Before we get to the show, I want to give each of you a very warm welcome and say thank you so much for tuning in this week and always. My name is Paula and I am the host of the show. I am a hybrid of project manager, life coach, and podcasting consultant. And the thing that I love to do is help women bring their own show and their own message to life through podcasting either through helping them launch a show or create a show or maintain a show. If you want to find out more about Jumpstart Your Joy or about me, you can find the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com. And if you are thinking of starting a podcast, you can also find a really handy cheat sheet there that will give you all of the hardware and software that I use to create this show each week. And that is from the start a podcast button on the homepage. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, which will have some links to some of the things that I'm talking about, you can find it at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash boundaries. And while you're on the site, of course, you can find 178 other past episodes with all sorts of joy and entrepreneurial fun over at the site. So let's jump right on into this week's solo cast. If you've been listening for a while, you know that I am a big fan of Brene Brown and her work. And of course, her most recent book is one called Dare to Lead, which the subtitle of this one is Daring Greatly and Rising Strong at Work. So Brene's taken this amazing work that she's done in the past that's been mostly focused on individuals and translated it to how we can use it at work, which is really exciting. So on page 47, she talks about working with her team. And she says, over our years of researching and working together, we've learned something about clarity that has changed everything from the way we talk to each other to the way we negotiate with external partners. It's simple, but transformative. Clear is kind. Unclear is unkind. I first heard this saying over two decades ago in a 12-step meeting, but I was on a slogan overload at the time, and I didn't even think about it again until I saw the data about how most of us avoid clarity because we tell ourselves that we're being kind when what we're actually doing is being unkind and unfair. Feeding people half-truths or bullshit to make them feel better, which is almost always about making ourselves feel more comfortable, is unkind. Not getting clear with a colleague about your expectations because it feels too hard, yet holding them accountable or blaming them for not delivering is unkind. Talking about people rather than to people is unkind. So I've taken this nugget of clear is kind and unclear is unkind and really thought about how it can be applied to my life as an entrepreneur. Knowing that so many of us have left a nine to five job and in doing so probably left various working situations that maybe were not aligned with how we wanted to work and that we're trying to create a business for ourselves that feels more aligned with the kind of people that we want to be. Now, that could be how you work, meaning it could be the time that you want to spend, you want more flexibility, you want to be your own boss. It could also be that maybe, like like myself, you've run into some situations in a corporate job that you felt weren't very kind. And in creating your own company, you really want to be able to create something that feels like it is a place that reflects you and your values and allows you to be the kind of kind person that you really wish you could be. And so in a lot of ways, creating your own company or being your own boss also brings up all of this personal development stuff. And there's really no way to ignore it because all of a sudden, there's no one else to watch you clock in. There's no one else to tell you to do something. And you get to decide who you are as a boss to yourself, which of course is can be both freeing and completely overwhelming. And one of the things that I've noticed is that I very much want to be the kind of boss for myself that I 
like that I do the best work for. And so in doing that, it means that I have to be really clear with myself and I have to practice the things that I wish my old bosses used to do for me. And it's all a really big, exciting growth challenge. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about how I and how you may be able to set boundaries that will allow for more joy in your work, both around the work and defining what the work is that you do and around defining your time and how you spend it. I could also see that there's some other topics that might fall into this and they might be something that I unpack on a future episode because I think these are really interesting topics. So if we use this lens of clear is kind and unclear is unkind, let's look a little bit about how you can define the work that you are doing. But basically what I'm going to be talking about first is your niche. What is the work that you do and who do you do it for? I know from having both been a project manager and having gone through life coach training that sometimes as you start to define your own business, it can be very frightening to get into niching down into a subcategory. Because I think one of the fears that comes up is that by saying, I work with XYZ, it means that you are in fact saying that you don't work with the rest of everybody else. And so I think there is that concern that if you define who you work with, then somehow you're alienating everyone else. But the first thing that I want to say about this is that it's actually easier and more beneficial to state who you work for because it lets you shine and use your gifts that you have in a very specific way. Also, when somebody is looking to work with someone, it gives them a very clear reason to work with you. They're no longer going to be second guessing about, I think she's a life coach, but what exactly does she do? Instead, then they can see, oh, and I'm using totally hypotheticals, this is not my line of business, but she's a life coach who works with women who are returning to the workforce after having had three children. Like, if that's your niche, then it's very clear what you do and who you do it for. And it aligns you with working with those specific people. It also gives people the ability to refer other people to you. You know, maybe I don't do that kind of specific coaching, but I know someone who does, and it's very easy for me to say, oh, yeah, My friend Julie works with people who are trying to get back into the workforce instead of it just being a vague and open-ended thing that you do. The other thing that I've found extremely helpful in niching down and really defining what it is that I do and for whom I do it is that it helps me focus. If you're a long-time listener of this show, you know that we have a lot of people on and I talk about being a multi-passionate, multi-potentialite or a renaissance soul. These are people that have a really hard time stating that they have just one thing that they want to do with their lives. The real bonus is that we make great entrepreneurs. We have so many great ideas and we are often amalgamating more than one idea all together to then create something brand new. The thing that's also hard about being a multi-potentialite is that you do have so many ideas and sometimes all of those ideas seem to be competing for your attention. And so it's really hard to like sit down and get working on just one thing because you start to wonder about all the other ideas that seem to keep hitting you. Laura Sims does a lot of interesting work in this area when she talks about finding meaningful work that can be your career. And so in taking kind of this idea as a lead, I think it's really important for each of us to narrow down the things that we are going to do for work or for our career as an entrepreneur so that we can focus on it and become highly skilled at it and that it becomes an offering that we become known for. It's definitely going to be one of those things that you really love doing. In my case, that's podcasting and kind of mixing in project management and coaching. And so that's a really unique blend. But it's also somewhat narrowly focused. And so it allows me to talk about what I do and share with other people about it. It's also something that's meaningful to me. And I think that's really important when you're looking for something and defining it for yourself as an entrepreneur. And so those are all the reasons that I feel like it's very important for you to to name your niche and really start to own it as an entrepreneur instead of trying to be all things to all people, and potentially run yourself ragged in the process. The other thing that I want to focus on in this week's show is around how do we set up kind boundaries and clear boundaries for your time as an entrepreneur. And that is both around the time that you are working each day, the time that you are available for work, 
And how do you set that up to really honor and build in self-care? Because I know from having gone from a corporate schedule, which is, of course, very structured, and you know what to expect, into a more open-ended and free-flowing schedule when I work for myself, that it is important for me to set up boundaries. And so what I'll go through for the second half of this episode is some of the tactics, so tips and tricks almost, that you could embrace or kind of modify for yourself and use to create more structure in your day around your time. Because I know as a perfectionist and as someone who is definitely an overachiever, it's very easy to find myself working long hours without a very clear cutoff time that I can just go to bed. (laughs) That's where I'm at one day. But I think Putting some of this structure in place will allow you to also become the kind of kind boss and the kind of person that you wanted to be when you started this entrepreneurial journey. One of the ways that I have found to extend this kindness as far as time and boundaries go for myself is to set up clear start and end times for each day. And I'm going to admit that these can be somewhat flexible could be that different days of the week have a different start and end time. Maybe, you know, that might even change over time as well, but really setting up the structure for myself of I start work at this time and I end work at this time for this day. And to make the very clear break of I log on and then I shut the computer and I log off. I think this is really difficult because as perhaps perfectionist or an overachiever, it's super easy to want to put in more time. It's also really easy because you're on your own to want to to answer that one last client email that comes in at 6.30 or 7. But I encourage you deeply to resist (laughs) the urge to respond, especially when something comes in after the hours that you have set for yourself, because clear is kind and unclear is unkind. And in this situation, if you start to answer emails after your working hours, then you're starting to set a kind of dangerous precedent with someone that says, I can be flexible and work when you're working instead of you sending the very strong and kind message of these are my working hours and this is when you can interact with me. I think that most people really appreciate being given that kind of definition of what your working hours are, and then they know what to expect. Because if you start to get into that pattern of answering emails at 7 or 8 or 9 p.m., then it becomes an expectation, which is not kind to yourself and it's not kind to your client because it's probably not something you really want to keep doing. Set the time limits on yourself. Probably try and keep them consistent that you log in around the same time, you log out around the same time each day and just keep with it. The other thing around this that I will say I think has been really helpful is set aside some non-working time for yourself. Generally, this would be a weekend, especially if you have a family. Maybe it's a different day each week because that feels freeing to you. Um, But set aside a day or two each week that you are not working because I know you're working hard and I know you're doing so much and you deserve the time off. Along those same lines as well, set off some vacation time for yourself. Just block it off on the calendar, even if you are taking a week just to not do work and you're staying home. Block the time off and if you can afford it, also book the tickets so that you have the things all ready to go when you are ready to take that vacation. One of the exceptions here to some of this scheduled working time that I'm talking about is something that I've seen come up as an entrepreneurial mom who has a child in elementary school. One of the things that I really do love is that I'm able to take some of the time off on, say, Thursday mornings to go into school and help in his classroom. And so As I'm scheduling each week, I make sure and block off that hour and a half so I can be there for him. It means that sometimes I have to find another hour and a half during the week so that I can work, but I love being able to honor that that's one of the things that I want to do with my time and that I can schedule it in. The other thing that really needs to find its way onto your calendar and into your schedule is the stuff that is just for you. And Yes, yeah, some of that is doctor's appointments and et cetera like that, but, and stuff like that. But the other thing that you really need to schedule in is time that is just for you to go do something that has nothing to do with work. 
And in my life in the last couple of months, that's looked like looked like having lunch with my mom. We've been able to do that almost every week, and I really delight in that. It is very special. It may also look like you scheduling in time to go take the dog for a walk or go out and, you know, browse some shops that you've never browsed before or spend a day just going into the city that's closest to you and spend some time there just exploring. Julia Cameron of The Artist Way used to talk about this being kind of a date with yourself. And I think this is so important, especially when you're working hard and you are doing so much for everyone else. It's really important to schedule in some time on your schedule for things that light you up and that are exciting to you. And you have to schedule it in. Or as we know, the days go by so quickly. And before you know it, it's three months later and you haven't had a day to yourself in weeks. (laughs) So please schedule that in. Another thing that is related to this kindness and creating clear boundaries for ourselves is getting a really good understanding of how much time it is taking us to do tasks. One way that I have started trying to gather data around how long it takes me to do each thing, you know, whether that be create and record a podcast, whether that be create my outbound marketing email each week, I have started logging every task that I do into an app called At Work, And it helps me establish how long it takes me to do each thing. Now, as a project manager, this is interesting to me because I like to know how long I need to then schedule for each thing in future weeks. But it's really hard to do that when you don't know how long each thing is actually taking you. So I would encourage you to start timing out the things that you know you do each week then you have a much better idea of how long you're spending on it and how much time it will take you whenever you do it again in the future. At Work is a great app for that. The other thing that At Work is really good for is starting to track your time that you are spending on client work if you are working on an hourly basis. I think all of us woefully underestimate and underjudge how much time it takes us to do tasks. And so what I've found is I start my timer immediately when I start working on client work. And that gives me a really good sense of how long it took. And I know that my billing at the end of the month is very accurate because I think oftentimes we'll say, eh, it was just an email. It only took me a minute to read and then two minutes to reply. And I bet if If you start tracking things, you will discover that you are actually spending a lot more time doing each of those little things than you ever realized. So don't leave anybody on the table. Make sure you're tracking it and then use that tracker to help inform what you are invoicing for at the end of the month. The other thing at the crossroads of kindness and time management that I see is one of my favorite sayings, which is right size the effort. I am betting and I have discovered as an entrepreneur and a small business owner, there are lots of tasks that I don't necessarily love to do. (laughs) And I think if you find that you're doing something repeatedly, it's, you know, something that you're doing every week or so, that it either takes you forever to do it or that you don't really love, but you find you have to do it every week and you kind of dread it. I would first ask, is this a task that really has to be done or is it something that you could eliminate altogether? I think there's probably a lot of things that we all do each week that we could probably diminish or eliminate and it might free up some time. And I think that would be a great kindness to yourself. (laughs) If you really don't need to do it, just let it go. I think the other really kind thing to do is to look and see if it's something that you could find a way to delegate. In my own world, that means that I have an editor that works on my podcast, and by delegating some of my editing work to him, I save a lot of time every week that I can then spend elsewhere in my business, and that is a big win for me. It also is, you know, it's helping another person do the work they love, and so I think there's a great kindness in that and recognizing that I don't love it, but somebody else does. Similarly, it might be that if there are some more admin-related tasks that you do not love doing or that you feel like someone else might be faster at, finding a virtual assistant is also a really great way to buy back a little bit of time for yourself 
and begin to grow a team that in turn will then allow you to have more time to do the things that you love to do. And I think if you kind of put the lens on it of if you were a boss, and you are, you're the boss of yourself, (laughs) and you could help someone who works for you find a better way or a faster way or a smarter way to do something, you would probably love to do that. And that's really what hiring a virtual assistant allows you to do, is it allows you to free up time to do something else that you love to do. And it allows someone else to to embark on doing work that they love to do. So it really is a win-win. And I think we'll talk more about teams in another episode, but I just encourage you to start thinking about who and how you might be able to delegate work to, even if you aren't currently. I'll say for my own world, my life changed when I decided to get a virtual assistant. And it has been a really amazing thing to be able to bring someone else on and do some of the work that I used to do. The last thing that I want to look at in this week's show is the crossroads of marketing and time management. As we all know, the marketing side of a business can take up so much time. And the thing that I would recommend in this space is for you to really consider how much of the marketing that you do, are you doing because you feel like you air quotes should do it? And how much of it is actually garnering a response for you? So if you take a look at the places that you are putting your time, whether that be social media or email marketing or other things that you have in your ecosystem, so maybe you have a podcast or a blog, and it doesn't necessarily have to be return on investment, meaning not specifically that you get a lead that then converts into being a paying customer, but what if those things are getting you any kind of traction? You know, are they getting any clicks? Are they getting any likes? Do you see your audience growing or maybe shrinking on a specific social media? Take a look at those things and notice what is getting traction. Notice where your clients are actually coming from. Sometimes it's hard to tell and sometimes you need to send out a little survey to say, where did you first hear of me? And that could be a huge boon for information about what you should keep doing. I think the best way to market your business is the way that is working, which sounds a little bit backwards, but I bet you know that you are actually getting results on some platforms and not on others or through some routes and not through others. So for instance, there's a company called Lace and Grace that was on uh, Shark Tank and they do a ton of their business through Instagram which is a growing niche at this point, but I think that is basically how they've done most of their sales. One of my friends, Helen, who was in an earlier episode, I'll link up to that in the show notes. Early on, she started a majority of her work as a life coach through her email newsletter, which, you know, if you love it, that's great, but not everyone's gonna go all in on an email newsletter. And she did, and it worked really well for her. Alexandra Franzen, who has also been on the show, is an author, She's given up all social media. She sends out a newsletter and that's about it. And as for myself, almost all of my clients come through word of mouth or reference, or they know me personally from some other way and eventually decide that they want to create a podcast. And that's how we start working together. So I think knowing and understanding where your clients come from will really help inform then where and how do you right size the effort and the amount of time that you spend in each of those channels. Maybe you can let go of one or two of them all together. And I think it's worth looking at the data to see what is working for you. And so that is it for this week's show about defining your work and your niche and defining your time and really leaning into the kindness that you can bestow upon yourself and the joy that you can find in running your own business. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, you can go to the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash boundaries, and you will get the links there to some of these past episodes that I've referenced. 
along with some of the books that I have referenced as well. And I would love to hear if you liked this episode, feel free to email me at jumpstartyourjoy at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you guys and love the feedback that you give. Additionally, if you want to start your own podcast, you can find the cheat sheet over at the website jumpstartyourjoy.com. Just click on the start a podcast button and you will get that downloadable sheet with all the hardware and software that I use to create the show. Next week, I'm really excited to have Liz Applegate. She is a friend and a coach and a fellow podcaster. And we are going to talk all about processes and how to get shit done. (laughs) It's going to be a lively conversation. And I know you guys will just love it. I hope you'll come back next week for that show. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.